Sons of Jews speak. And that will conclude the session of today. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the special lecture in the series of Bridges Dialogues for a Culture of Peace, which is organized by the Jamaican University and the International Peace Foundation, and partly sponsored by the Gasikon Bank. It is our pleasure and honor to have with us today the Nobel Laureate for Medicine for the year 1993, Dr. Richard Roberts, who will give a lecture on his discovery of slip genes. At this time, we would like to invite the President of Jamaican University, Associate Professor Dr. Tatai Smith, to give an introductory speech. University, Associate Professor Dr. Tak Chai Sumit, 
Chairman of the Board of Directors, the International Peace Foundation, and distinguished guests. In the celebration of humanity with our borders and admiration of Thailand as a peaceful country, the Sikang Land is proud to, to sponsor species of 22 different local rarities for the next two years. Each Nobel laureate will deliver his or her keynote addresses in Thailand as part of the International Peace Foundation, which just dialogue towers a culture of peace project. On behalf of the Scrum Bank, I am honored to present Dr. Richard J. Roberts, the winner of the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1993. Thank you. Finally, the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Professor Dr. Piron Commander Tanaku, will deliver a remark. Professor Richards, no point. The President of Trancon University, Chairman of the Peace Foundation, and the President of all the Scott Titan, a bridge dialogues towards a culture of peace aims to invite us to cross borders and to build bridge by listening and opening up to various viewpoints, by generating new thoughts and by developing innovative forms of cooperation. And as you know, the real audience for various views are invited to join local. This program will lead to a new world of more understanding among each other. The Faculty of Medicine, John Paul University, therefore is very really pleased to cooperate with the increased organization at this foundation that's going to make such risks become true. Thank you very much. Associate Dean for Research of the Faculty of Medicine, Professor Dr. Stephon, to be the path to introduce the honorary speaker to you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, our Nobel laureate, Dr. Richard Roberts, was born in 1943 in England. He has always liked logic and mathematics. As a child in elementary school, he enjoyed solving crossword and logical puzzles and also reading mystery. He even fancied as a child of becoming a detective so that he can get paid to solve puzzles. Fortunately for the scientific community, he discovered chemistry and chemical experiments and decided that he liked it better. Dr. Roberts later on attributed the origin of his love for science with puzzles and Sherlock Holmes. Dr. Roberts went to Sheffield University and received his BSc and PhD in organic chemistry. He then discovered his new passion, molecular biology, by reading a book by John Kendrew, which turned out to change the course of his life. He did his postdoctoral study in biochemical uh, biochemical laboratory at Harvard. After that time, he worked at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. He had been involved in studies of adenovirus 2 and discovered split genes and RNA spacing in 1977, for which he received his Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1993. In his acceptance speech, he stated that Philip Sharp who got the uh, Nobel Prize together with him and myself, I would like to express our deep gratitude for the unparalleled honor conferred upon us today. Science is very a solitary occupation, and our discovery of split teams depended heavily on the talented colleagues 
and a vast body of experimental biology that have preceded our work. We view this award as a tribute to those colleagues and especially to our co-workers, Richard Jelinas, Louis Chow and Tom Broker from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and Susan Burton and Claire Moore from the MIT. Dr. Roberts' current interest focuses on the identification of restricted enzyme and methylase genes within the gene database and the development of rapid methods to assay their function. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 1993 Nobel laureate, Dr. Richard Roberts. Well, distinguished academicians, distinguished students, it really is a very great pleasure to be here. I see, while all of this talking was going on, it obviously took far too long because my computer decided that it should shut down. <laughs> However, it does seem to be recovering. What I'm going to try to do to you today, or do with you today, is to give you some idea of how we came to make the discovery of split genes. And I think you will see from this uh, a number of features that characterize scientific research. Um, one is the immense tedium and uh, the immense frustration that goes into it uh, when you're doing experiments uh, and they're not quite working, or at least they're not working the way you think they should. We'll also see, I hope, the importance of luck. It's really tremendously um, good as you're doing research, in fact, as you're doing anything in life, to be on the lookout for those lucky breaks that make all the difference. And in this particular case, I think what I hope you will take away from all of this is that sometimes very big things can come from rather small beginnings, from rather small questions that you ask. And it's always very important, no matter what you're doing, whether it's scientific research or anything else, to look for the opportunities in life. Um, something unusual happens, you take advantage of it. Uh, something, some lucky break comes your way, you should take advantage of it. We all have luck. Uh, many of us just cast it aside. We don't, we don't think we deserve it. But in fact, I think it is very important whenever you get a lucky break, to make sure that you follow through on that. Now during this talk, I'm going to try to give you some idea in language which is essentially a layman's language of exactly what it is we discovered and how we did it now. Okay. So, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about cells. You know, all living organisms are made up of cells. In the case of bacteria, they're rather simple cells. In the case of humans, in the case of any higher organisms, the cells are much more complicated. They have very complicated structures. But there are a few basic components that are present in all cells. First thing is this outer layer, this outer membrane, which is really just a case that holds everything in and allows certain molecules to pass from the outside to the inside. For instance, water typically can move very easily in and out of a cell. Small chemical ions are able to move in and out rather easily. Sugars sometimes can move in and out easily. But usually there are special systems that are needed to transport the sugars in and out of a cell. As with salts, and things like sodium ions, and things like potassium ions, there is active transport moving these elements in and out. Inside the cell, there is a molecule called DNA. I guess this year, uh, because we've just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the structure of DNA, there can be very few people who've never heard of DNA. 
DNA is just this double-stranded molecule that contains all of the instructions needed to make a cell. We'll be talking some more about this later. There is also inside a cell a molecule called RNA, which is an exact copy of a small part of the DNA, of one of the strands of the DNA. And then we have amino acids. These are the building blocks of the proteins. Proteins typically catalyze all the reactions that take place inside a cell. They also provide building blocks, structural materials, that maintain the integrity of the cell. And then there's sugars and a lot of small molecules and so on. So for the purposes of this talk, we're really going to concentrate on DNA and on RNA and the processes that involve them. Now, if you imagine this schematic diagram up here as representing a part of a DNA molecule, DNA has a series of building blocks which we call nucleotides um, that carry bases A, C, G, or T. And along the DNA molecule, typically a DNA molecule in a single bacterium, maybe three, four, five million of these units long, of these nucleotides long. A typical human piece of human DNA, a single chromosome, maybe as many as 200 million of these basic building blocks long. A, a gene corresponds to just a tiny portion of a long DNA molecule. And we know where a gene, or at least the cell, knows where a gene begins and ends because there are very distinct sequences of these nucleotides that mark the beginning and the end of a gene. And what these sequences do is that they send signals to a protein a DNA, an RNA polymerase rather, this is a, a big bulky protein that knows where to begin on a gene and where the gene ends and will specifically make a copy of just one strand of that gene and will make a copy into an RNA molecule. The RNA molecule is called the messenger because this messenger serves to take the information from the DNA into RNA and eventually into a structure called a ribosome, which will be responsible for making proteins. So what happens is we have the basic building instructions here. We have a copy of them on this mRNA molecule. This RNA is then passed to a quite complicated machinery. A ribosome has perhaps 50 or 60 different proteins. They're all concerned with decoding the message here and making a protein. And I'll show you how that decoding takes place in a moment. But the messenger RNA also has a start and a stop signal to it, telling the ribosome where to begin making the protein and where to end making the protein. So all of this information is encoded in a code, a string of nucleotides that was present up here in the original gene. And of course, a long DNA molecule, say the chromosome of a, of a or one human chromosome or the genome of a bacterium, contains many, many genes. Now here's what I mean about the flow of information. What I've done here is actually to write out in shorthand form the chemical structure of a little piece of DNA. So here's a small stretch of DNA, the bases, T, A, C, G, T, A, G, G, just form a continuous string. And the two strands of the DNA are related because whenever one has a T on this strand, there is an A on this strand, and vice versa. And this was a, an absolutely crucial discovery that was made as soon as the double helix was discovered by Watson and Crick that it immediately showed you how you could replicate DNA, how DNA could be the <coughs> replicative material. Because as soon as you know the sequence of this strand, 
just by invoking the rules A over T, T over A, G over C, C over G, and so on, you automatically knew the sequence of this strand too. So you could pull the two strands apart and then hope to make an exact copy of the two strands, and in this way, you make two molecules of DNA. But in the process I'm showing here, we're not actually making two strands of DNA. We're going to copy one strand into RNA. And what happens when we copy DNA into RNA? A, C, and G get copied into their primary nucleotide equivalents, but the base T, which stands for thymine, is actually copied into an RNA base called uracil. Um, they're chemically very, very similar. The one difference is they lack that uracil is missing a methyl group that is present in T. But they're very, very similar. And this RNA is the material that carries the message from the DNA into the ribosome in order to allow proteins to be made. And the RNA is read by something called the genetic code, in which three bases at a time, UAC, GUA, GGC, and so on, are read along the RNA. And every time the UAC is present, the ribosome adds a tyrosine residue to a growing protein chain. And so they become a one-to-one -one correspondence between a trinucleotide here, GUA, which codes for valine, GGC codes for glycine, UAC for tyrosine, and so on, until you come to a signal at the end which says stop translating, and then it finishes, then the protein is made. So this, in a nutshell, is how DNA makes RNA, makes protein, this was called the central dogma by Francis Crick, and really has been a, a key to understanding molecular biology, to understanding the very essence of how DNA can contain the instructions for life and how it can make protein. This was all worked out by about 1966 or so. Now, if you look at bacterial DNA, bacteria are the, among the simplest organisms we know about. <coughs> bacteria typically live everywhere. They actually account for more biomass in this earth than anywhere else. A large part of your body, for instance, is bacteria. If we look in any concrete building, after it's been up there for a few years, we'll discover there are bacteria living in the concrete. Um, they love it there. We never see them. They're tiny but they love it there. Our skins crawl with bacteria. The air is full of bacteria. They're, they're literally everywhere. It's hard to believe that you can look out and see forests, and see people, see elephants, you can see all these large animals. They don't constitute the largest biomass on this earth. It's actually the bacteria that do that. And the bacteria are the organisms we understand least. There are much more diversity out there, many, many more bacteria than there are humans or plants or anything else. And it's a very exciting field to be working in at the moment because so little is known. But bacteria were among the first organisms from which we actually really began to understand the essence of how they worked. And a lot of the work that was done early on to understand genes to understand messenger RNA and proteins and so on, uh, involved work with bacteria. Now we knew that in a typical stretch of bacterial DNA, we had things that I've marked here in gray that are genes. So this gray piece is a gene that encodes an enzyme. So DNA makes RNA makes protein. And in this case, we can imagine it's an enzyme that hydrolyzes lactose to give glucose, and the lactose will produce energy. Here's another gene shown schematically up here that encodes a DNA polymerase, the enzyme that is necessary to replicate the DNA. And so as we go on through this long list of genes that is a typical bacteria, maybe three, four thousand genes, you discover that the gene product each is responsible for some key part of the metabolism of the cell, something that makes the cell work. And if we look along this DNA, we 
discover that the genes are all arranged in a nice linear fashion, one after another. Typically, there's a space in between, marked here by these green boxes. And that space contains signals that mark where a gene begins and where a gene ends. And again, in a typical bacterium, there's actually not a lot of space between the genes. The genes tend to be quite crowded together. And one reason for this is that bacteria typically multiply very rapidly. Perhaps every half hour or an hour, in favorable conditions, they can double, uh, make a new copy of themselves. And so anything that is carrying along a lot of waste that would slow it down just doesn't double as quickly, and so they get left behind. And natural selection takes care of them. They disappear. So there's been a great selection to really keep everything as efficient as possible and not to carry a lot of garbage around. Now, when I first moved to Cold Spring Harbor in 1972, there was a little bit known about what was going on in terms of genes and the signals that were controlling them. But everything that was known had all been worked out in bacteria or in viruses that infect bacteria. And we knew that, say, human DNA or the viruses that interact with human DNA were really quite different from bacterial cells in many ways. And I became interested in the question of whether the signals that control genes in adenovirus were the same as the signals that control genes in bacteria. I think if you'd asked almost anybody at that time, do you expect there to be differences, they would have said no. And so, in a way, by doing this, we, we had some preconceived notions that we were going to find the same kind of answers in higher organisms, particularly in adenovirus, that we found previously. But nevertheless, being a scientist, one always wants to know um, whether things are the same or whether things are different. And of course, if you're like me and love finding new things, you always hope that there'll be at least a little something that is different. In order to pick a system that we could work on, we chose agnovirus. Now, agnoviruses are small icosahedral viruses. Almost everybody in this room will have been infected by an agnovirus. Maybe when you were one, two years old, your mother thought you had just developed a cold. All of the symptoms are the same as those of a common cold. Two, three days, you get over it, and you build up an immunity to agnovirus, and you never get infected again. It's just one of these transient viruses comes through, it's uncomfortable for a couple of days, and then you develop antibodies and become lifelong immune. But it turns out it's a very nice virus to work on experimentally in the lab, because we can grow it rather easily. We can take tissue culture cells, human tissue culture cells, put adenovirus in, and it will replicate, it will make lots and lots of itself. And it has one very nice advantage, is that when it does infect a human cell, early on it turns on a set of genes, and those gene products then stop all of the normal human cell activity. And essentially, the human cell becomes full of messenger RNAs that are encoded by adenovirus. So normal human messenger RNAs will sort of slowly disappear, and by a few hours after infection, you only see messenger RNAs that are being made by adenovirus. And so we have a great supply of lots of messenger RNAs. What we knew about adenovirus prior to 1977, which is, um, well, actually we started this work about 1975, but prior to um, our discovery, what we knew was that at the left-hand end, adenovirus, I should say, is a DNA molecule. It's a bag, almost 40,000 base pairs long. But on the left-hand side of the genome, there were a bunch of genes that we call early genes. And these were genes that as soon as the virus went into the cell, it started making messenger RNA corresponding to just this little segment at the left-hand end of the genome. There were a few others too, but these were the predominant ones. Later on, when the virus had managed to replicate itself and started to make new viral particles, 
It needed a lot of proteins to package itself into the appropriate uh, coat. And these are all the late genes shown up here. And we knew there were quite a lot of late genes. And all in all, as a result of some pretty crude experiments that had been done, we had the idea that there must be somewhere between 15 and 20 genes that were present in our virus. And so we thought that what we would do would be to try to find one of these genes that we could characterize in detail and understand exactly how it was regulated. So here's the idea. We want to find one adenovirus gene. <coughs> this is the gene here that is making RNA. This is the start point where the RNA is being made. What we were especially interested in was to know whether this sequence that precedes the start point of the RNA, we call it the promoter, but this is the regulatory sequence that tells the polymerase, hey, start making RNA at this point. We wanted to know what was the sequence of the bases just up here, so that we could then compare that sequence with a sequence that were known to be present in bacteria. So there were several promoters for bacteria known, we wanted to know if the adenovirus promoter was the same. Now you'll remember I just told you that adenovirus is linear. And we knew that the first RNA that was made when adenovirus first infects a cell starts at the left hand end and goes in. And so we thought the thing to do would be to isolate a little bit of this RNA. We'll determine the sequence right here at the start of the RNA. Because the DNA, this is actually the end of the DNA right here, we thought all we would need to do would be to determine the DNA sequence coming up through here, see where the RNA began, and then by definition, we would know the sequence of the DNA that was the promoter. Very simple idea. We sequence the end of the RNA, we sequence the DNA leading up to it, and then by deduction, we must know this must be the promoter up in here, and we could compare it to the bacterial sequence. Well, when we tried to do that, we discovered that when adenovirus first infects cells, it doesn't actually make a lot of RNA from this early promoter. It only makes a very small amount, and not enough that we could actually isolate it and work with it in order to determine its sequence. Now, part of the reason for that was that we were working back in the 1970s, and the techniques for doing this were just not as well developed as they had been previously. Today, probably could do it. Today our techniques are much better than we could do it. But back in the 1970s, the techniques were not far enough along to allow us to do that. And so what we did instead was we started to look late during adeno infection. Because we knew that late during adeno infection, almost all of the message being made in the cell was in fact <coughs> made by um, adenovirus, it corresponded to adenovirus messenger RNA. So let's go back to this slide. And so what you see here is that there were all of these late genes, and I say in total we thought there were probably 15 or 20 of these. And so we thought, well, let's characterize and pick one of these. Let's say find the one that there is most of, and we'll study that, because there we should be able to get enough material. And then when we were thinking about the methods that we were going to use in order to actually characterize the messenger RNAs, an interesting discovery was made in several different labs at the same time. And that was that at the start of these messenger RNAs, there was a very special chemical substituent that was put right at the start. It was called a cap structure. It contained a guanosine residue in a funny orientation, and it had three methyl groups. That turned out to be a very nice biochemical marker, and we quickly came up with a, a scheme that would allow us actually to look at just the very end of the messenger RNA and to purify just the very end of the messenger RNA from a huge mixture. We could take all messenger RNAs and using this technique that I devised, we could catch just the start here. And so we thought the experiment to do would be we, we would take all of the messenger RNA from adenovirus cells, we would catch all of these 
five prime ends, and then look at them. Uh, there is a method that was developed in Fred Sanger's lab in England. Fred Sanger won the Nobel Prize many, many years ago. In fact, won two prizes, but one of them was for DNA sequencing, the other for protein sequencing. He had developed a method that was very nice for separating out pieces of RNA. And we thought that by doing our experiment, we could actually follow what was happening to all of the individual messenger RNAs all at once. We expected that we would find 20 spots. We thought we could separate them in a very nice way and monitor each one individually. And then the one that was strongest, the one which there was most, would be the one that we would do our promoter experiment on. Well, I was working at the time. I had a, an excellent postdoc who had come to me from Harvard called Richard Gelinas, who was doing these experiments. And so I set him to do the experiment. Well, he did it. It worked beautifully. But when he looked at the answer, instead of seeing 20 spots, there was just one. All of the messenger RNAs that were being made in adenovirus seemed to have just one cap, one start, one kind of starting point for all of the messengers. Even though we knew that the messengers were scattered all over the genome and one expected all the sequences to be different. Well, of course, as a typical supervisor, I said, well, you know, Richard, you just better go and do that experiment again because you must have done something wrong. And so he went back and did the, did the experiments again and I guess was a little more careful the next time around, but still got the same result. So as with all supervisors, I immediately said, well, look, you know, why don't you go and sit down and I'll do the experiment. I'll show you how to do it properly. So I did the experiment and I got exactly the same result. Well, and of course, at that point, now I believe the result. <laughs> so here we were. We had an unexpected finding, um, something that really didn't make sense. We were convinced experimentally that we had done everything properly. But of course, you talk to your colleagues about this sort of thing, and you know, they, they knew what was expected, and they knew it shouldn't look this way. And so they tell us, oh, you must be doing something wrong, your technique can't be right, and no one would believe the result. Now, for someone like myself, there is nothing, and I repeat nothing, that makes me want to do something more than for someone to say, you've done it wrong, you shouldn't be doing it this way, go and do something more productive. So, Richard and I then spent the next year trying to prove uh, that the result we got was genuine and to try to understand what it meant. <laughs> the bottom line, and if I can really put it clearly, the bottom line, as we were looking at the experiment, said that whatever was sitting at the end of this message, and whatever was sitting at the end of this message, and whatever was sitting here and here, they were all the same. Now there are two possibilities. One possibility is that this is added in some separate way, so that this piece of sequence at the end here comes from just one place and gets added to the RNA, or the sequence is repeated at many points in the genome. Well, it turned out another postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory, uh, a young Indian woman who was extremely talented, Sajid Zain, was looking very carefully at just one of these, actually this one, a fiber message RNA, and she showed convincingly that in the DNA sequence up here, this sequence that we were finding at the end of all of the messages simply wasn't present on the DNA. So here was one example of a message that didn't have the sequence at its five prime end. Whereas all of these other messages, um, by our analysis, Richard Gelinas and I, it did have that sequence there. So this led us to speculate that what must be happening is that the sequences at the end of the message were being coded at one place on the genome and the messages were scattered elsewhere and that somehow a mechanism existed to join the two together. Now this was a radical suggestion, it was against everything um, that the dogma 
would have you believe it was totally different from the way the bacteria made message. And yet, the more experiments we did, the more we liked the idea that this must be what was going on. Now, let me show you a picture. To give you an example of just one experiment that we were trying to um, interpret uh, and that helped us in our thinking. Normally, if you take a single strand of RNA and a single strand of DNA, where the DNA is, is, is the region that the RNA has been copied from, you can actually mix the RNA and the DNA, and they will form a nice double-stranded structure called a hybrid. And the process is called hybridization. And what happens is that in a typical messenger RNA, you get complete hybridization here, except at the three prime end, the right hand end of the messenger RNA, where in higher cells, there's an enzyme that has added a whole string of A residues. It's called poly A polymerase, and it's put there after the RNA has been made in order to stabilize it. We thought that what must be happening, that there must be a similar sequence up here at the five prime end of the RNA that had gotten on there by some process that we didn't understand, and that it too was not hybridizing next to the DNA. This was the explanation for Saida Zaid's experiment with fiber messenger RNA. And so we reasoned that if this in fact was the case, let us say that a typical RNA had sequences at both ends that were not coded on the DNA, then we should be able to detect them. Now it was already known that if you had this long poly A stretch of the three prime end, you could actually make synthetically a long stretch of poly T, remember A and T hybridized to one another, and you could take that stretch of T and attach it to a very big molecule that you can see in the electron microscope, and in this way you could in fact find these sequences where the poly A was. And so we argued that if we could make a long DNA molecule that was complementary to this five prime region here, we could also make an electron microscopic marker, some marker that would tell us where this was. And we had an idea of what that, that molecule should be, and because I come up with a theory which turned out to be totally wrong, that one of the small RNAs being made by adenovirus might be the source of this particular RNA molecule. Well, the idea for this experiment came one Saturday morning. After about a year's worth of work that Richard Gelinas and myself had been involved in, and which had really gotten us a lot of data but had not led us to the, the experiment that would really prove what was going on. And, and we were gotten into the habit of we work all week, and then on a Saturday morning have a post-mortem to sort of try to understand why the previous week's experiments hadn't worked, or at least had not shown us what we wanted them to show us. And so we would on the Saturday just brainstorm and try to find the experiment, the, the thing that would prove to the world that what we'd been saying all along really was correct. And it was this realization one Saturday morning um, that just came to me out of the blue. I had no idea where the idea came from, but Richard was up at the blackboard and he was proposing some very convoluted and complicated experiment. And I guess I wasn't paying attention. And then all of a sudden I said, aha, I know how we can do it. And so this was the thing. I basically drew this on the blackboard and I said, what we need to do is to find the piece of DNA that will hybridize here, so that, and then hopefully will be much longer, and so then we will know for sure where this is being encoded. And Richard said that sounded like a great idea. There was just one small problem here, and that was that neither Richard nor I were electron microscopists. We were biologists, biochemists, molecular biologists, but we, we didn't have the, the electron microscopy expertise. But fortunately, just down the hall from where we worked at Cold Spring Harbor were two very talented electron microscopists, Tom Broker and Louise Chow. And they were in that Saturday morning. And we went down and we talked to them and said, you know, here, 
we have this great idea for an experiment, and would you do it for us? So they looked at the experiment and said, well, you know, no one's quite done that experiment before. Well, sure, why not? Let's give it a shot. So we spent the next Saturday and Sunday, or Richard spent the next um, Saturday and Sunday, making the two reagents that we needed in order to do this experiment. We gave those reagents to Tom and Louise, and on the Tuesday morning, they came back with um, the result. And so, what I had drawn on the blackboard was the idea of this long piece of DNA hybridizing to the five prime end of the RNA and showing us that A, it really was there, that it was not coded um, to its message, and this was where it was coded. And lo and behold, the very first electron microscopy micrograph that Louis Chow looked at looked exactly like this. It, it was just as I'd drawn it on the board with one wrinkle. Instead of there being hybridization at just one point here, actually a point up here also hybridized to a continuation of the RNA here. It was actually hybridizing at two different points, meaning that instead of there just being a single piece of RNA here that had become joined to the main part of the message, there were in fact two, and they were two separate locations. Well, Louise went on, we made a, a whole bunch more molecules so that we could map these, show where they were coming from, be sure that we knew what we were doing. And what came out was what we now know of, of split genes. This is a typical late gene in adenovirus where the main part of the gene, this is the gene, the sequence that's actually coded for the protein, is located over here on the DNA. And then there's a big gap. And now we come to a small piece of RNA that is made here, another one here, another one here, and all of these four green pieces become joined together in much the way that when you make a movie, um, the editor will cut and rejoin little bits and clips of film in order to make a continuous whole. And so what you see coming out at the end is just these four green pieces all joined together, and these intervening regions are just discarded and are lost. And incidentally, we still don't know what happens to these intervening pieces of RNA. Some of them are stable for a little while, but if they have a function, we don't know about it. And it turned out that this scheme, whereby the genes in adenovirus were split into pieces, is the way that every gene, almost every gene, in your body, in my body, in every higher organism, this is the way they're laid out. And this is in total contrast to the way that genes in bacteria or archaea are laid out, where they're all in just a single piece. They have a start, you read through, they have a stop. In a human, that is not the case. A gene begins over here, we make an enormous, long piece of RNA, and then you have to splice out and remove all of these intervening sequences that are not a part of the final messenger RNA, and not needed in order to make the protein that it comes from. And why we do this is totally unknown. And we have no idea yet why genes are this way. What it has done, though, is to make it extremely difficult to interpret the human DNA sequence. Um, I think, you know, you hear when the human genome sequence was first done a few years ago, several years ago, then, you heard that people were estimating how many genes are there, how many genes we have. If that sequence had been a bacterial sequence, it would be very easy to hand up all the genes. But because of this process, where the genes are split into pieces, one can't always know uh, whether, for instance, this piece is really the first piece of the gene, or the second, and there's one missing down here, maybe there's another one down here, or maybe this is already halfway through the gene. And it becomes very, very difficult. There are no simple computer programs you can write that will tell you where the individual bits of the genes come from. And in humans, Many genes typically will have 50, 60, 70 pieces, enormous numbers of pieces. 
So it's, it's quite a tricky business. And as you can imagine, uh, this was quite a revolutionary discovery. This was completely unpredictable. Nobody had guessed the human genes were this way. And it, it, it had really a very big impact. And we were fortunate to have done the right experiments at the right time. I think it's fair to say we knew that we were onto something big about a year before we finally proved what we had. And at about the same time, Phil Sharp's lab at MIT, who shared the Nobel Prize with me, his lab had made a similar kind of discovery, also in adenovirus, but completely independent of our work. So it was, it was a terrific discovery to make, mainly because it was so unexpected. You know, a lot of times, you're, you're going along, you're doing research, and you sort of know there is something to be discovered. That there's a problem. You know, you look and you say, well, how could this work, or how could that work? Um, but you know it does work. And so what you do is you go along and you work out how it works. And very often, it's very elegant how it works. It's really nice to have done it. But it's even nicer when you come across something that was unpredicted. No theoretician that said that this was the way. Nobody had even guessed that things might be this way. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, as it fell, and so it, it, was, it was just a wonderful discovery to make. So that all took place in March of 1977. And then uh, a lot of time passed until in 1993, um, I got a phone call one morning. I was actually working at my computer. I, I wanted to get up early in the morning uh, before my family does and actually do a little work. And this was Columbus Day, which is a holiday in the US. It's a Monday morning, and I was up, I was writing the paper, working away at my computer, and all of a sudden the phone rings at 6.30 in the morning. Oh, shit, this is going to wake the family. You know, so I, I've got to stop this at once, and so I rushed to the phone, and I said, do you know what time it is? And the person at the other end said, um, have you heard the news? And I said, no, what? The, the person said, well, this is CNN, and you've just been awarded the Nobel Prize. <laughs> well, at, at, at that point, I wasn't quite so angry. <laughs> so that started really a, a, a wonderful part of my life, a very exciting part of my life. And if we can put some of the, can we move to the slides, and I'll show you some of the interesting things that happened. So one of the first things that happens if you live in the U.S. and in the good old days when Bill Clinton was president, um, we got invited down to the White House. So this is my wife, uh, and this is Bill. I apologize for the quality, but it's um, caused by the projection here. <laughs> but anyway, so we went down to the White House, had a very nice meeting down there. Um, we got shown around rather nicely. We also did a bunch of other things. Um, uh, is it possible to change? How do I change the focus on this? Can someone get, try and get this focus for me, please? So, the, the big thing that happens is that you get invited to go to Stockholm. And they, they really treat you extremely well when you go to Stockholm to pick up the Nobel Prize. So as soon as you get to the airport, um, you fly by SAS um, from Newark to Stockholm. But you get to the airport and they immediately are looking for you and make sure you're taken care of. You get on the plane, they announce to everybody on the plane that they have Nobel laureates aboard. They, they take unbelievably good care of you. They give champagne to everybody and insist that they all drink your toast. And then they had a special cake that they gave with dessert called Gato Nobel. And they gave it another toast to um, tell you how great you are. Oh, this is really disappointing that you can't see this better. Anyway, this is actually the stage in the concert hall in Stockholm um, where they give the prize over here. We have the king and queen and two more members of the royal family. And over here, if you can see anything, this is where the Nobel laureates all sit. So maybe I'll uh, maybe we'll skip these because they're just not showing up well enough to, to do them justice. I'll, I'll try and describe some of the things that happens. So you 
they, they have this wonderful ceremony. They have some nice music, and then they say all sorts of lovely things about you, things that it would be far too embarrassing to uh, say about yourself. And then you go and shake hands with the king, and he presents you with the prize and so on. And all in all, um, the, the ceremony is sort of full of pomp and circumstance. It's really very nice, even if you don't care for that sort of thing, you can't do anything but be overawed by this. And there's tremendous competition for people to get tickets just to go to the ceremony. Uh, of course, the competition to sit on stage is much greater. After the Nobel Prize ceremony, we then go off to the town hall where they put on probably the most marvelous banquet I've ever seen in my entire life. There are some 1,200 people who sit down to dinner and they have of the order of five or 600 waiters and waitresses who are serving you. Very grand occasion, unbelievably grand occasion. In between each course of this meal, there is entertainment of one sort or another, and at our particular banquet, at one point, all the wine waiters came out, some 200 wine waiters, um, each carrying three bottles of wine, they fill everybody's glass, and then put the wine down and all burst into song. And it turned out they were a male voice chorus um, that had been gathered and practicing from all over Sweden, just in order to do this one event at the Nobel Prize banquet. And there were a number of other things that followed along the same lines. All of these kinds of, of things that went on were the things that, you know, if they just happened once in your lifetime, you think, well, this was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And yet, day after day after day, uh, there would be a special dinner or a special ceremony or something else that, um, that just made it memorable. There was also unbelievable quantities of champagne flowing. So from typically the first receptions began about 10 in the morning, and so there was champagne every time there was a reception. Probably the most difficult thing was to stay sober for any significant length of time. But it was it was a wonderful experience. One um, that when it was all over, we were actually very glad to get home and get to bed and get some sleep because we didn't really sleep very much for the week that we were in Stockholm. But I would recommend it to all of you. Being, um, something, if you get that call, say yes. <laughs> and finally, I, I really have to share with you my secretary's description of the Nobel Prize. She says, the Nobel Prize is the prize that keeps giving. And the reason she says that is because ever since I won it, I've had nothing but nice invitations to go and do wonderful things including coming to visit you in Thailand. For that, I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Richard, for your professional and fruitful uh, lecture today. So, uh, if there is any question now, the floor is open. And for your comments, please handle uh, the question that you write down on the sheet paper to our officers around so that uh, Dr. Richard uh, will answer your questions, please. Okay, so it is the first question. It's remarkably scientific. I, I apologize for that. This is from Sanipa, is that right? Sanipa Suragat. So did I get that right? Whoever that is? It's okay? Okay. The, the question is evolutionarily. What would be the benefits of having RNA splicing in higher organisms? Well, I think this is something that a lot of people have pondered over. Uh, many people have speculated about just what is the advantage. 
For a long time, there was a debate about whether splicing was just a remnant of how things used to be when genes were first forming. Uh, these were the introns, they call these bits and pieces that have to be taken out introns. This was called the introns early theory and was pushed very hard by another Nobel Prize winner, Wally Gilbert. And then there was increasing evidence that most of the introns looked as though they had arrived late, uh, maybe around the, the time of the Metazoan expansion, so maybe 600 million years ago or so. And I think today there is very good evidence that a large number of the introns that we now find did come late. Overall, though, it looks as though, on balance, there were some introns that were present early and others that were present late. And so, the arguments as to why they are still around are that, well, maybe there are important regulatory signals that are encoded within them. There are certainly some examples of that. So, there are quite a few introns where it's been shown that there are sequences within the intron that control gene expression, control how RNA polymerase gets to the gene and actually controls its expression. And so at the present time, I would say, the, the best argument as to why these things are still around is that they do contain regulatory information of some description, but only a tiny fraction of it do we really know. And I think for anyone who's looking for a good uh, project to get into, to find out what introns are doing is an excellent one. Um, for instance, at the present time, we don't even know how the cell recognizes the boundaries of these introns. There are some small sequence motifs that are present, uh, but they're not enough by themselves to define the specificity. There must be other, other processes going on that say whether a given sequence is going to be an intron or whether it's going to be an exon, that is a part of the final message RNA. So I, I can't give you a good answer at the moment because we really don't know the good answers. Uh, the next question is, uh, what inspires you? And what advice would you give to a, a young scientist in a country like Thailand? Well, what inspires me? Um, a lot of things inspire me. I think probably the, the, sing, the biggest single thing that inspires almost any scientist is just an insatiable curiosity. It's, you, you see things happening, you look around you and you want to know why. You know, why, why do trees grow up? Why don't they grow to the side? Why, why do the branches form the way they do? Uh, if you look around you, there are tremendous numbers of things that are not properly explained. And I think you just have to find that area that really you find to be fascinating and that you think of as being a great hobby. Make a passion of it and then get a job doing it. Uh, I think for anybody who is smart, they can always make a career out of their hobby. I, I don't think I work. You know, my, my wife is always complaining, oh, you work too much. But I, I just, I don't think of it as work. I love every minute of, of what I'm doing. I love science. Science is my hobby. And it has been ever since I discovered chemistry. You know, when I was a kid, I used to love to make fireworks. Now, unfortunately, in the U.S. today, it's very difficult for children to get a hold of the chemicals and to be able to make fireworks. And yet, for many children, the way that they get interested in science is by doing some hands-on science. And, you know, it's inevitable kids are going to want to do things that are a little bit dangerous. So I always tell everybody, <coughs> make more fireworks. Do not make enough fireworks. And give your kids the opportunity to really do some experiments by themselves. They may lose a finger or two along the way. <laughs> Life is not without risk. But just maybe just as an aside, I should say, a couple of years ago, I gave a commencement talk at my son's school. And so I gave the same sort of advice to all the kids. These are high school students. 
And I said, the one thing you should do is make more fireworks. And the headmaster immediately rushes up and says, this is not official school policy. <laughs> Uh, those six gigs allow more variations for limited DNA length. Um, okay, so introns do allow for more variation. That, that, there's several ways to deal with this. So you can imagine that if you have a gene and it's got lots and lots of introns in, one thing that you can do is you can actually um, forget about some of the exons and perform something that we call alternative slicing in which instead of saying joining exons 1, 2, 3, 4, you skip one of them and do 1, 2, 4. In this way, you would end up making a protein that is different. It's got like a deletion in it. Maybe in one protein, you, may, you go exon 1, 2, 4, in another protein 1, 2, 3, and in fact never join 3 and 4 together at all. And this way, you would have one gene that's making two different proteins. And so one of the possibilities is that, or an evolutionary advantage to having introns, is that it, in theory at least, would allow you to, from a single gene, make many different proteins. So by not using all of the available exons, you could in fact make many different proteins. Some of which have things in common, which perhaps are needed in many different cells, but then some that are perhaps cell-specific. And so, for instance, there are examples in muscle cells, the different kinds of muscle cells, that often have proteins that have one little domain in them, in, say, skeletal muscle, and a different domain in smooth muscle. There's a possibility that, say, within the brain, where there is enormous diversity and where we really don't understand how the, the complexity of the brain is laid out, that processes like alternative splicing could be important in laying down all of the different kinds of cells that are present in the brain. We just don't know about a lot of this at the moment. And we're only just beginning to develop the techniques that really would allow us to look at this in a large scale. You know, if you imagine we've got probably 30,000 human genes, this may give rise to, say, 300,000 different transcripts, perhaps 3 million different proteins, um, in order to be able to look in every single cell type in a human and try to figure out which of these 3 million proteins is being made is an enormous task and way beyond any technology we have at the moment. But people are trying to, to develop methodologies that would allow them to look at that. I think in five, ten years' time, we will know much more about what is going on here and just what is the role of splicing and alternative splicing and so on. But at the moment, it's very difficult. This may be the last question. As we know, that the Nobel Prize the highest uh, honor uh, prize for scientists or even in many, many areas. How the Nobel Prize changed your Scientific life, Well, yeah, the Nobel Prize is, is a good one to get. Um, but for all of you who've never yet won a prize, I say don't give up because for me, the Nobel Prize was the first prize that I ever won. Probably also will be the only one because once you get it, they don't like to give any other prizes. How has it changed my life? Scientifically, I think it's not changed my life very much. I was fortunate. I work at a small company, and they really don't have, they don't gain any great benefit by my having a Nobel Prize. They're a private company, We're not in the business of trying to raise money or anything like that. And had I been at a university, I would have probably spent lots of time being asked to help with fundraising. And, you know, every time they get a rich donor in, they like to wheel out the Nobel Prize with us. So shake hands with the rich donors. I, I don't get involved, fortunately, in anything like that. Um, the company that I work for already treated me much better than I thought I ever had reason to deserve, and so they just continue to do so. Uh, they certainly don't, they, they like me to come and do these sorts of things. They've never made any objections to my traveling. Um, 
So what, what can I say? It's, I, I've met an awful lot of people that I would not otherwise have met. And that's probably the single bit, biggest difference. So for instance, you, you guys probably know Harrison Ford, the actor. Uh, I, I've met him. <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg. Just, I, I've met really large numbers of people, but it's, um, well, it was nice to meet them, and ordinarily I would just never have run into, into any of them. Don Karen, the fashion designer, a lot of people, a lot of people. But scientifically, I think it's been, it really hasn't changed my life. I still do research. I work, I don't work in the lab, I work with a computer. I have a, a small lab, a bio labs. Continue to do interesting things, and fortunately, the company doesn't mind what I do, so I'm free to follow my nose and do whatever kind of research I want. Thank you. So uh, now I would like to invite uh, Professor Piron, the one that I've been the dean of the Faculty of Medicine uh, to uh, give the closing remarks. On behalf of Faculty of Medicine, Terangkot University, and King Terangkot Memorial Hospital, Thai Cross Society, right to convey my sincere appreciation and heartfelt thanks to Chad J. Roberts for his contribution and fruitful lecture. I hope that this event will pave ways for our cooperation in the future. I would like to invite to Dean Griffiths to present our token of initiation to Dr. Chad Roberts. First, I would like to invite the Secretary General of the Thai Health Society, Mr. Pan Van Meiji. Presidents of the Rongo University Council, both said that they are up to one So, in conclusion, we'd like to thank all of us, all of you, and especially to Dr. Richard Roberts for being here today and inviting uh, mentors. Um, so to conclude, we'd like uh, we'd like to invite you to a reception. Uh, what floor? Fifth floor after this. Thank you very much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next time.